Good morning. <clears throat> Warm welcome to our service here at Craig Lockhart this morning. Welcome if you're joining us on the live stream or later. It's lovely to have you with us. Just a few notices this morning. Um, if you might have seen uh, the pictures from the bonus trip uh, just during the week there, which um, I wasn't there, but I'm told it was a great success and everyone had a really good time and even far too much food. Is that right, everyone? Big meals. So, and much enjoyed. So thanks to everyone who went along, had a great time. Thanks so much to the stewardship team for organizing that, another uh, successful event. So um, we're very happy that everyone had such a good time there. Um, just to remind you about the jazz concert, the students from Baylor University in Texas coming on the 12th of July at half past seven. And tickets are available from Alan. And have you got some, Kath, or just Alan? And Alan's here. Alan's here, he is here. So uh, you can get the tickets from Alan, and uh, we've already got some people, one or two folk, phoning up, uh, booking tickets. And that's going to be in aid of the Red Cross appeal. So all the money raised from that is going to go to that. So that's going to be a really good night uh, with some very talented uh, musicians, I'm so I'm told. And um, so we'll look forward to that. So if you want to get your ticket, um, please go and see Alan today. And so that's another... Uh, stewardship team uh, event running. So for that reason, there's no produce stall. This is it this week that there was meant to be. First one in July. All oh, right. So that one. So they've got enough on their plate, organising everything else. So, uh, so it won't be a produce stall in July, and we'll let you know when the next one's going to be after that. I think that's all the notices, unless there's anything else. No one told me anything. I don't think. Great. Right. In the last days it will be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Our hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Let's begin our worship by singing this great hymn, good hymn for opening the service. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Let us pray. Dear Father, 
we gather together this morning to draw close to you and give you praise. As the hymn said, we are weak, but you are mighty. We know we cannot face our journey through this life without your guiding hand. We confess that we often forget you as we struggle to come to terms with the stresses, anxieties, bereavements, and illnesses that this life brings. But you have given us all we need through the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we crown Lord of all, knowing that through his sacrifice, all our sins have been forgiven. Stir in us through your Holy Spirit songs of praises, no matter in what circumstances we find ourselves. We ask that you open our minds and hearts to hear you speak to us this morning. And when we find it difficult to put into words all we need to say to you, our Father, we thank you that your Son taught us how to pray. Hear us now as we say together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Let us continue our praises by singing together, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Um, 
Now, as you will remember, we were able to restart our youth club, Impact Youth Club, um, last year after, I think, 24 months of not being able to meet, uh, doing some stuff online, but nothing very successfully. So um, I thought it'd be a good time to let you all know uh, how things are going. Um, now, Impact, if you don't know, is our open youth club for people aged P7 to S6. And the programme is it's very relaxed. Uh, we don't have many organised activities. Some, and uh, the young people do enjoy having time to spend with friends, using our facilities and sitting around chatting. We use the whole of the building, except for this room, uh, obviously. And our activities, are we have table tennis, a play station, basketball, football, and a snack bar, and one or two other things as well. Now, the reason for it, we have impact uh, when I first brought the idea to the Kirk session, whatever, 19, 20 odd years ago, whatever it was, um, we had two goals and they remained the same. So they are to provide a safe, fun environment where young people can make, meet uh, their own friends and make new friends. The second is to build relationships so that we'll be able to share the gospel with them and invite them to other events where they'll hear a Christian witness. As you imagine, one of them is a lot easier to do than the other. At the moment, we have a small team, which is our son Cameron, uh, myself and James McLean. Uh, and, but we also have a few people on standby, so uh, if we need someone, then we're always able to get someone to come in uh, and help out. Now, the current group we have is made up, strangely enough, although I'm looking over here just in case I get this wrong, they're all either P7s or S3s, I think, is that right? So that's a strange little combination, but over the years, that's, we've got two impact members sitting here, so they'll keep me right. Uh, and they're either from uh, Ox Gangs Primary, Furhill High School, and one from Curry High School. So that's just the way, the way the group's been put together has been strange every single year of it, so. I do expect to, uh, uh, to change a little bit uh, from after summer when we restart and the new P7s come along and the high, new high school folk meet friends and invite them. So at the moment our average attendance is about 20 and almost all of them come every week. Uh, and as with every group of young people who've come to Impact uh, all the years it's been running, they're a very great bunch of kids, very friendly uh, and enthusiastic and always well behaved. So you can ask Sheena, she uh, was an impact leader for many years and knows that there was never one instance of bad behaviour in the whole time. Is that right, Sheila? No. <laughs> Just about, yeah. <laughs> but at the moment, they're all very well behaved. And uh, so even though we've got a small regular team, they're, they're very manageable. And this particular group, I'm not sure why, and again, these things come and go, are obsessed with games of TIG. And they run around. There's two, usually two completely different games of TIG going on with different groups. But they spend the whole evening racing around inside and out, except on the corridor, we were always shouting walk when they're going down that corridor down there. Um, and the running inside and out. So it's great to have this, this lovely warm weather and the light nights for them to enjoy the outside. Although, having said that, whether it's raining or dark or whatever, they still go outside. So um, We've also started to organize games of Nukem Ball, which they have really loved. And in fact, practically every kid I've ever met who plays it likes Nukem Ball. Um, now, next Thursday will be our last impact of this academic year, uh, and so I'm happy to be able to report you that we've had a really great restart after all the lockdowns, and we look forward to seeing the group grow and the relationships with the young people grow. So we really appreciate uh, if you remember our group and our, the young people and our leadership team in your prayers as we look for opportunities to interest, introduce them to the gospel and build good relationships. Now, if you want to know any more, please uh, come and speak to me. Ben and Noah actually go to Impact so you can speak to them. Um, they'll be the ones in my office looking at their phones. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, but, and also, if you want to know what Newcomb Ball is, you can ask me later as well. So uh, that's just to keep you up to date with what's going on uh, in the important part of our youth ministry. And uh, we do appreciate your prayers and your support for, um, for Impact. So let's carry on in our worship now by singing the hymn from the breaking of the dawn.
The reading this morning is Psalm 77. In the day of trouble, I seek the Lord. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he shut anger, shut up in his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, or when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Amen. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Let us pray. Father, we can identify with the psalmist. Our eyes are open to the evil that surrounds us today. We hear of kidnappings in Nigeria where children are ran for money or young girls are sold into slavery as wives of mercenaries. So many governments turn a blind eye to the suffering of minorities in their countries. Some turned out of their homes just because they are Christians. Lord, we ask that you will encourage NGOs to continue to request changes and implementation of human rights laws to alleviate suffering in Mexico, Sri Lanka, Sudan, and many other countries. We thank you for organizations such as CSW, Tear Fund, and the Red Cross who work tirelessly to make a difference throughout the world. We think of those who risk their lives crossing the channel to come to this country and ask that negotiations between France and ourselves can resolve this problem in a more humane manner. Lord, change the hearts of the Russian soldiers so they will see how their actions are killing many civilians and ruining lives, that they will tell the Russian people the truth about what is happening in Ukraine. Let this evil be overcome by the truth. We humbly bring our own money, time, and talents to your church and ask that they, that we, be used in your mission 
Bless those seeking to bring new plans to enhance your mission in Edinburgh Presbytery. Lord, your will be done. Help us to be the people you want us to be with the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Continue to speak to us through your word. Amen. Let us continue our worship by singing together, O Jesus, I have promised.
should have said I should have said earlier to welcome Andrew Elder as our organist today. Sorry about that, Andrew. So lovely to have you with us today. Let's join in our prayer together. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your great glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I wonder uh, what you would say if I were to ask you what makes you angry. You might not be an angry person, but there's no doubt that all of us get angry from time to time. Could be trivial things, like waiting for someone to answer the phone while reassuring you that your call is very important to them. I think that one, yes, we all get that one. Or uh, one of my own personal irritations, um, if you're driving along behind someone, then they slow down and pull over, and just as they stop, they put their indicator on. And you're, don't, what are you doing? I don't even know how you're... So that one gets... That one does annoy me a little bit. Or, of course, it could be much more um, terrible things than some of the which Norma mentioned in her prayer, things that are happening around the world that we're saddened by and angered because there seems to be so little will to do anything about them. But the question we want to begin with today is what makes God angry? There's plenty of evidence in the Bible to show that God gets angry. But we do find when we boil it down that the only thing that makes God angry is sin, whether that's through disobedience or neglect of the needy, turning aside to false gods, all of which are contrary to what God has told us in his word and are summed up as sin. So where does that leave us when considering the psalm that we had read to us this morning? Now, the writer, and we don't know this person's identity, is calling out to God and asking difficult questions, casting doubt on God's faithfulness and uttering an honest cry from the heart. But does this make God angry? Is it a sin to doubt God? Is it wrong to ask God why? I read an article recently where someone was advocating the use of curse words in lamenting to God. I'm not sure I would really go that far, but do we have to express our honest, exp- suppress our honest expressions? Now, you may already have guessed that the answer to these questions is no. And we find ourselves in some good company when we're thinking about times when we might have cried out to God from a low place in our lives. Let's just consider these two statements. How can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? And... It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. So no doubt you'll have recognized that these are uh, Bible verses and the cries of people who have come to a point where they don't know what to do and don't understand what God is doing in their situation. Now these statements came from Moses and Elijah, two hugely significant figures who were powerfully used by God throughout their lives. And who at the time of making these statements were not just young guys starting out in their ministry or new to their tasks, but older, and both having had seen God work mightily in their lives and powerfully through them. This was after they crossed through the Red Sea, and it was after the miracle for Elijah at Mount Carmel. But they experienced seasons where God felt far away or seemed to ask too much or didn't seem to be listening at all. Now, I could have added to that list the names of Jonah sitting under his withering vine in the desert, or Jeremiah's woe for the disobedience of the Lord's people and the weight of God's judgment on a stubborn and rebellious nation, or maybe Nehemiah's grief at the state of Jerusalem, and so on and so on. And maybe you're thinking now about a time in your own life where you can easily identify with what these people are saying. Maybe it's something you're remembering, or maybe it's something that you're in the middle of. How are you speaking to God? Are you opening up your heart to a God who already sees your heart and already knows what's in it? All of this is to say that, as the psalmist shows us, we can cry out to God and express ourselves openly without raising his anger towards us. I first went to church at Wester Hills Baptist, and in the youth group, we were encouraged to pray out loud at our meetings as we do in our Sunday night meetings here. As you can imagine, it was a scary thing to do, and it took me quite a while 
to pluck up the courage to pray like this. So while we were praying, I would rehearse what I was going to say in my mind before I would say it out loud because I didn't want to sound silly. Uh, I didn't want to start saying something then run out of steam. But often while I was practicing in my head, someone else would pray for the very thing I was practicing to pray for. And for some reason at that time, I never felt that if it had already been mentioned, I could then mention it again. But I, I know that does sound really strange and it sounds daft saying it now. But that was what I felt at the time. And I, had to, I felt really strongly I had to make sure my prayer sounded okay, that it wasn't a repeat of something someone else said, and worst of all, it didn't make me sound unspiritual. Uh, but the last thing I thought in all of all this uh, anxiety and nonsense was that I was talking to a God who just delighted to hear my prayers and wasn't bothered whether they sounded good or not, or if I said them out loud or in my head. Our prayers don't in any sense have to be a performance. God doesn't judge us on our use of language or good phrases. And he doesn't get angry at us when we're honest about what we feel and what's going on in our lives. Something like a third of the Psalms are full of or contain laments. So that can be our guide. God put these Psalms in his word as a template for a type of prayer that he finds acceptable. Now that's certainly what we find in Psalm 77, which as we'll see is a Psalm of two halves. In the first half, verses one to 10, the writer lays out the lament to the Lord. And as we saw in our reading, he doesn't hold back. His hand is stretched out with wearying. His soul refuses to be comforted. When he remembers God, he moans. He's so troubled that he cannot speak. And in the night, he remembers his song to the Lord. Then in verses 7 to 9, he asks his six or maybe five questions, depending on how you read it. And the, the more I read these questions, the more I liked them, and the more encouraged I was to find them in the Bible. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And we can see that they're heartfelt and come from a person who has had this long season of trying to hear from God and understand what God has allowed to happen. But at the same time, they are so unreasonable, almost like a rant at God. Now, some of you remember this guy from a TV show, um, I've not written what the name of the TV show is now, I can't remember. One Foot in the Grave, sorry, for the very thing I didn't write here. But this is uh, Richard Wilson playing the character Victor Meldrew, the very grumpy old man who's always complaining and he feels like the whole world is out to get him. And his poor long-suffering wife has to listen to him rant on about the latest indignation that's entered his life. And these questions, though, are altogether different a type of complaint, not of a man who can never let himself be content or happy like Victor, but one of a writer whose lament has reached a point where they feel they have to pour out questions. There's an honesty about them that perhaps we can identify with. We know the writer already knows the answer to these questions. Otherwise, why is he even bothering to labor in prayer, as he obviously has been doing? The answer to all these questions directed at God is no. And as we go through the rest of the psalm, it will become obvious that the writer knows that. But again, we have this pattern in the Bible showing us that this is a type of prayer that when we're driven to it, is acceptable to God. Maybe you've found yourself uttering questions like this when you've been angry or fed up with someone. You know the questions are irrational, but in your hurt and indignation, they just come out, and sometimes it can feel quite good to get them off your chest. And maybe they have that effect on the writer because the second half of the psalm takes on a different note. Now, we don't know what's brought about this change. The circumstances may have changed or the writer is starting to regain confidence, but the last few verses show that they've moved from lament to remembering. I will remember the deeds of the Lord, who is great like our God. With your arm, you redeemed your people and led your people like a flock. The one comparison between the two halves shows that change clearly. In verses 1 to 10, the word I appears 10 times. 
Now, understandably, in the midst of the lament, the writer is concentrating on themselves. They are the one who's feeling so abandoned. They are the one whose nights are filled with pondering on God's seeming absence. And they are the one from whom the list of questions pour out. We don't blame them for saying I so much. But if we look at the second half, verses 11 to 20, we see the words you and yours used 17 times referring to God. Now, there's a good chance that when writing these last 10 verses, the writer has in mind the Exodus and particularly the crossing of the Red Sea when God overcame a mighty obstacle and imposed his will on a chaotic situation and led his people toward the promised land. So we see that in verse 16. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. And verse 19 your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. So in this instance, the answer to the lament is to turn back to God and remember the things that he has done. The God who saved Israel from the Egyptians is the God who is listening to the lament we see in the first part of the psalm. And that God never changes. If he was faithful then, he's faithful now. If the lament proves a pattern for our prayer, then so does the change in focus from the individual to the Lord, from I to you. During these low times, the temptation is to stop reading the Bible, stop praying, and maybe stop coming to church to share in fellowship with other Christians. What's the point, we might ask? God isn't answering me. But that's not what the writer did. Clearly, they felt far away from God, but they chose to keep their focus on God and use their memories or the stories of times past to remember God's faithfulness and his power to change what was going on. The only way that could happen is because the writer already has knowledge of God and of his works. The change in tone is not an academic exercise, but one born out of the relationship that the writer had with God. He had confidence that God was real because God had already been real to him. But is that the lesson we want to take away from this psalm this morning? When God seems far away, just cheer up and count your blessings. We said at the start that we don't know the identity of the writer of Psalm 77, but many commentators think that this was written during the time when the children of Israel, God's people, were in exile in Babylon. Now that was when the Lord allowed the people to be conquered and taken captive and moved to live in a strange land. He had put up with their unfaithfulness for so long, hundreds of years, and warned them over and over again from different people but they refused to listen, so eventually the Lord gave them over to the consequences of their sin. That exile lasted 70 years, and we don't know where in that time frame this psalm was written. But what that means is, firstly, we can easily understand where the lament came from. Being captive in another land, away from the land promised to Abraham all those years ago, and away from their great city in Jerusalem. But secondly, we can see that the writer praised God and remembered his mighty deeds of the past while he was still in the midst of his suffering and knew that the Lord was still with him. God eventually answered their prayers and they were released from captivity and most of them went back to their own country. That's what we read about in Ezra and Nehemiah going back to rebuild the walls in the city of Jerusalem. But it took a long time and yet people like the writer of this psalm came to know that the Lord who was with Moses and Aaron when they, left it, when they left Egypt, is still with them. So instead of counting your blessings, which does have some merit, we can say that we count on the faithfulness of God. He is with us in the low part of our lives. When he feels far away, he has given us permission to cry out like the writer of this psalm has done, to express our doubts and to ask our questions, maybe even rant a bit, because that is a path to remembering his faithfulness. Maybe not always understanding what's happened, but knowing he's with us in tough times and with us when the clouds clear. We can be thankful for the psalms like this as much as we are thankful for the psalms, our uplifting psalms of praise, because we're not always one way. Life goes up and down, and God's word is living and reflects our daily experience. If you're in a good place, the Bible will help you to praise God. And if you're in a low place, the Bible will help you to cry out. And in either case, 
we will see and know a faithful Father. Let's pray together. Lord, we know you as a faithful God. Thank you for the assurance that you are always with us. And thank you for this psalm, which shows us a pattern of prayer where we can cry out when we feel far away from you. And thank you that at those times we are still in the embrace of your love. Help us to grow closer to you through every season of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue our worship, singing together this start the hymn, Put All Your Trust in God. Let us go in the light of the resurrection of Jesus our Lord and the blessing of our one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all today and always. <laughs>